our speaker inspires you tonight as much as she inspires me. She came all the way from Canada to speak with us. Raised in a strict Muslim household, as a teenager she was forced into a marriage with a member of Al-Qaeda. Eventually, with nothing but a high school diploma, she was able to escape with her young daughter. Today, she is an activist, writer, podcaster, and a college instructor. Please give a warm welcome to Yasmin Muhammad. Turning point, and also I wanted to thank Julia and the Ayad Rasiali Foundation for putting this on, and a huge thank you to all of you for coming here tonight, especially those of you who drove in from Chicago and other places. I really appreciate it. Um, so I'm going to start my talk today with my very favorite photo here. This is a woman in Syria that was released from ISIS territory. And so here she is removing the black abaya, the black hijab, and underneath she's got this colorful dress on, and I just love the symbolism of this photo. Um, and if you watch the video, you'll hear that she's doing this sound that's like, I can't do it myself, but it's what they do in parts of the Arab world when you're really excited or really happy about something, so you'll hear that sound in weddings. So this is kind of, you know, my life right here. I don't have a photograph showing it quite so vividly, but this was sort of my transition as well. So I kind of went through, you know, I was in ISIS territory, but I went through that time of transition between being, living in a very orthodox community and then finding it. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself and how I grew up. This is the mosque that I went to school in. So um, it was this was the Muslim school. That's what it was called. Those doors there are where the men entered, though. The women would enter in the back. There was a door um, off the kitchen near the dumpsters, and that's where the women went into the mosque. And that's where I went to school from grades five, six, and seven. And then in grade eight, I was allowed to go to a public school because there was no Islamic high school. And so this is me when I was, uh, I guess, 13 years old. I had been wearing hijab since I was nine years old. And you'll notice the unibrow going on there because <laughs> in strict Islamic households, Girls are not allowed to remove any hair off of their eyebrows. Hair anywhere else is okay, but just not from the eyebrows. So that's why I had a unibrow. Um, and then later on, when I became a teenager after I finished high school, I was forced into a marriage with this man. His name is Asam Marzouk. I did not realize at the time that he was a member of Al Qaeda. Um, I only realized it later when I was contacted by CSIS, who are the Canadian CIA. So my mom started to, she just started to bleed from her nose and her mouth simultaneously, and I panicked, and I called 911, and an ambulance came to pick her up, and so I went with her in the ambulance, and that was the very first time since I was married to him that I was actually out of the house without him with me. And we weren't in the hospital for very long. The doctors took my mom away, and I was sitting in the waiting room. And that's when I was approached by CSIS. And they started saying things like, you know, bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, these words that they, they meant nothing to me. This was pre-9-11. So I didn't know who he was. But once I learned who he was, I felt like I really needed to get away from him because by then I already had a daughter with him. And he had always been talking about going to Afghanistan and living in Peshawar and I was like, why would I go to Afghanistan? Like it didn't, it was, it was ridiculous to me. But when I learned from, from CSIS that he was a member of Al-Qaeda, I understood, okay, this isn't, he's not just idly talking about one day going to Afghanistan. He's sincere, that's what he wants to do. 
So I wanted to make sure that I got my daughter out of that life. So people always ask me what it was like being married to him, and it's a really difficult thing to try and describe, right? Like for anybody that has been in an abusive relationship, they'll, they'll recognize this statement here. So this was in response to a journalist that asked me what it was like to be married to him. I said, it's been almost 20 years since I escaped, and that question instantly put a knot in my stomach and filled my eyes with tears. I don't know how to accurately describe this to you. I suppose the best analogy I can think of is suffocation. Have you ever had that moment of panic because you swallowed something the wrong way, and now you're coughing and you can't catch your breath? Expand that moment into years, and that's probably the best way I can describe it. So throughout those years, I was just trying to stay afloat. And luckily, um, I did get away from him and got away from my family as well. And I started to go to university. And before I tell you about that whole journey, I wanted to share with you this video that was made um, by Lalo Dagash, who is, you know, he's, he creates videos online. And um, one of my friends, Armin Navabi, who did the Secular Jihadist podcast with me, was, do, was writing something and he asked me to explain to him what it was like growing up Muslim because he grew up in a very different environment than I did. And so I wrote this for him, and then when Lalo read it, he said, can you read that out for me? Because I want to do something with it. So I said, okay. And I read it out for him, and this is what he did with it. Islam snares every moment of Muslim's life. How you eat, how you go to the bathroom, how you put on shoes, how you have sex. Every single aspect of your life is mapped out so that there's minimal opportunity to think. You are trained to just follow, do as you're told, don't ask why. Get in line with the rest of the Oma community of Muslims. Like a school of fish, it's instinctual. That's the way it is. That's the way the brainwashing goes. Like a soldier trained to take orders and react. Thinking is deadly. Questioning is punished. It is much more true for women than it is for men. Under Islam, a woman's sense of agency is non-existent. Her individuality is completely erased, or rather, never given an opportunity to flourish in the first place. Sometimes, like it was for me, the statement is both literal as well as figurative. My entire being was dampened by a black shroud, covered from head to toe, without even my eyes connecting with the outside world. I'd float around other humans almost like a ghost. I could see them, but they couldn't see me. I was invisible. My humanity was completely eradicated. I wasn't Yasmin. I was a faceless figure shrouded in black. My wants, needs, interests, desires, preferences were never even considered, least of all by me. I didn't know that there was such thing as choice. I'd never made a decision. I just did as I was told. I was miserable. But my misery also made me feel guilty. Why couldn't I move along with the other fish? Why did I yearn to escape their hold? Wasn't this the path to heaven? Any other direction was hell. Why wasn't I strong enough to fight the devil luring me to imagine a life where I could swim in different waters? Islam is ingenious in its hold. Aspects of its tactics can be found in Mormonism, in Scientologists and Jehovah's Witnesses. But Islam is the only religion that combines all the different snaring elements into one and then turns up the intensity tenfold. Islam's hold on your body, mind, and spirit is such that almost 15 years after denouncing the religion, 
I'm still discovering and suffering from remnant conditioning of my mind. I don't think I'll ever be truly free. I was only able to free my body. But I have not failed. My daughters are free. My daughters will never be able to relate to or understand any of this world. They will listen with wide eyes, unable to fathom that existence. And so, even if I have to take this indoctrination with me to the grave, I don't mind. I'm happy to take it with me six feet under, far away from my daughters, where it can't hurt anyone else from my bloodline. They'll all be free to spin in any direction we choose. So for show and tell, I brought a hijab and a niqab for you, the same kind that I used to wear. This was made for me by a student when I used to work in the Middle East. So I didn't have the heart to throw it away. So she put a big red maple leaf on it for me. <laughs> but I threw away all my other ones. And this is Nepal, which is two layers. So you put it on like this on top of the hijab. And then if you're in the company of people you trust, lift up this part and then you can see. And so whenever I would start talking, people around me would visibly like get scared, like where did that voice come from? I think they didn't expect to hear this voice from somebody who looked like this. They expected, you know, whenever I tell people my story, they think, oh, where did you grow up? You know, Iraq, <laughs> Afghanistan. So people don't, didn't know that this kind of thing happens in their backyard. So there's a common misconception now that this niqab is, or that hijab, is empowering. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass this around, and men and women, I'm hoping you'll just tie it on your face just for a few seconds, and then let me know if you feel empowered. from him, I started to go to university, which was something that I never thought I was going to be able to do. Um, I'd always wanted to continue my education, but it wasn't something that was allowed. So I had to get away from my family as well in order to go to university. And when I was in university, I just decided to take a history of religions course. It was just an elective that happened to fit into my schedule, and I had no idea that this course was going to change my life. So when I took that History of Religions course, that's when I realized that this book, we were taught that the Quran was this incredibly special book, and there's nothing like it on the planet, and it is divine, and it is, you know, it, it, it's just the most amazing thing. You have to do it. A, you have to wash yourself before you touch it. It can't go on the floor. There's all of these rules around this book and, and how important it is. And when I started to learn the history of all of these religions and also just pagan stories beforehand, I realized that a lot of those stories are in the Quran. So it's, you know, it was... It wasn't true. Everything that I was told, this book was so divine and it's the absolute word of God and it came straight from the heavens and there's nothing like it on the planet, turned out to not be true and we had historical evidence for that. So that was the first sort of break in the, in the concrete wall that made me start to question. And then one of the first things I did was take off the hijab. And for a while I lived this double life where at school, I would wear the hijab 
and by night I'd go out with my friends. And I did that for a while, but then you start to really, you just don't want to do it anymore. You just want to be yourself 24-7. You don't want to ever fake, you know, fake it and pretend and be somebody you, you aren't. So eventually I, you know, throughout, everybody in my life knew that I wasn't wearing a hijab anymore and it was just my mom. She was the final person who I had not shared this information with yet. Our relationship was already on shaky ground because I had left home and girls don't leave home. You go from your father's house to your husband's house. If you live on your own, you're a whore. So it was already very contentious. But I met her one day and I wasn't wearing a hijab. And she got very, very angry and she was concerned that the next step would be that I would leave Islam and become a Catholic. And so she promised that she would kill me before that happened because she wanted to make sure that her soul was protected. Because if she raised a daughter that turned out to be a non-believer, then that was on her. And she said, she's not willing to pay for my <coughs> sins. So I haven't spoken to my mom in about 15 years. I took my daughter and we went off and we just lived our lives. Finished school, started teaching, wasn't really concerned with calling myself anything. Um, I went through this process of, you know, I'm Muslim, but I'm not practicing. And it was like, no, actually, I'm not. I don't believe in religions at all. And then I'm an agnostic and all this stuff. And it wasn't until I was watching the infamous episode with Sam Harris on, and Sam Harris and Ben Affleck on the Bill Maher show that everything changed. So that day, Sam Harris was, and Bill Maher were saying things that made perfect sense to me. They were criticizing Islam in the same way that, they, that Bill Maher was known for criticizing Christianity. But somehow it was different. And Ben Affleck felt that it was totally gross and racist for them to be talking about Islam in the same way they talk about other Abrahamic religions. And the day after that episode aired, my Facebook was covered with people so happy and proud of Ben Affleck and maligning this horrible racist Sam Harris guy. And I was like, what? What is happening? Like, how could I have not shared any of this information with my friends to the point that these are people that are close to me, people that have known me for like 10 years, and they're so misinformed. So I started just on my own friend group sharing some information about my perspective and my life, and then it grew from there. So then I started to write my story, I started to write my memoir, and that led into activism. I was a reluctant activist. It wasn't really what I chose, but it kind of just happened. I started to talk about it, and then more and more people wanted to hear about it, and so here I am. <laughs> the most important thing that I want people to understand from when I do these talks is that is the irony of this. So Ben Affleck himself did this movie called Dogma where it was basically all about Christianity. And that was perfectly fine for him. But in order for Sam Harris to talk about Islam, all of a sudden, that's gross and racist. So there's a very big difference between talking about people and talking about ideas. We criticize ideas all the time, especially here in a place of higher learning. That's what you do, right? So there is no idea that's off limits. We should be able to talk about any ideas. And we should be able to judge other people's ideas. If people feel like it's OK to, uh, that child marriage is OK, we should be able to speak out against that. People believe FGM is OK. We should speak out against that. No matter what it is, you look at the actual thing. You, look, you, you judge the action that's happening, not the person who's doing it. 
So people have rights, ideas don't have rights. When we start to talk about Islam, people love to come up with this term, Islamophobia. We can't talk about Islam because that's Islamophobia. And it somehow become conflated with racism. Well, first of all, a lot of people are surprised to learn that only about 15% of Muslims are Arab. And I'm not sure what race they're referring to when they think that critiquing Islam is racism. So there are Muslims from all across the globe, from all different ethnicities, speaking all different languages. It's like if I were to critique Catholicism right now, right? How would you know if I'm talking about Catholic people from Mexico or from Italy or from the Philippines? You wouldn't because I'm talking about the religion. So it's the same thing with Islam. A lot of people tend to conflate the, the religion of Islam with the Muslims, the people, and when you're critiquing one, they think that you're being racist against the, the actual individuals. But we would never do that with any other religion. I don't know why Islam has this exceptional place where that only happens with Islam. So this confusion <coughs> causes some really bad things to happen. I believe, I'm a humanist, and I believe that humans always come before any religion. So here in Iran, in 1979, hundreds of thousands of women filled the streets protesting the forced hijab. Recently, around 30 women have been um, also imprisoned for taking off the hijab in Iran. So what they're doing now is they're just taking off their hijab, tying it at the end of a stick, and waving it. And for that, they get arrested. And one woman was just recently sentenced to two years in prison. They are threatened with 10 years and up. So while that's happening in Iran, while women are fighting for their rights over there, not only in 1979, but today, women in the US are very, very confused. <clears throat> they think that they're being supportive when they take the American flag and they turn it into a hijab and they put it on each other. They think that they are supporting women. But actually what they're doing is they're supporting the religion of Islam, and not just the religion of Islam, but the orthodox followers of the religion of Islam. So, you know, I think again people will be surprised to learn that the majority of Muslim women in America don't wear the hijab. Minority of Muslim women in America wear the hijab. So hijab does not represent Muslims, it represents those who are on the orthodox conservative Muslims, side of the scale. So whenever we see any other conservative religious clothing, we recognize that that's conservative religious clothing. But when it comes to Islam, somehow there's a confusion. So this is a video of the president of Egypt, uh, Imam Abdel Nasser, and the Muslim Brotherhood we're trying to tell him that he needs to make all the women in the country wear hijab. And so this was his reaction to them in 1953. <laughs> على أن يسيروا في الطريق الصحيح والطريق السليم وبلد المرشد العام للإخوان المسلمين وقعد وطلب مطالب طلب إيه؟ أول حاجة قال لي يجب أن تقيم الحجاب في مصر وتخلي كل واحدة تمشي في الشارع تلبس طرح So the subtitles are in yellow.
yellow, so I just want to make sure that you guys are following along what's happening here. As he said, the Muslim Brotherhood told me that I need to make sure that every woman in the country wears hijab. And the place erupted in laughter. And one guy yelled out, tell him to wear it. Being a woman in Saudi Arabia is exactly like being a slave. You are completely controlled by your master. A male guardian can use his authority to control your entire life. He can say you're not allowed to study or work. He has all the power. It's like an ownership. Can you imagine being an adult woman and having to get permission from a male guardian, like your father, husband, or even your son, in order to do basic things like getting medical treatment or traveling abroad? That's the situation women face in Saudi Arabia. Women there are now calling for an end to male guardianship with a new social media campaign. 
I spoke with one of the activists who wishes to remain anonymous for security reasons. Men have all the power. If I leave the house and my male guardian doesn't want me to, then he can just call the police and report me as an SKP. That means I'll go directly to jail for no reason, and I will spend the rest of my life in jail until my guardian agrees to take me back. This needs to stop. The Saudi media is not mentioning this issue at all. No one here is talking about it. They're pretending everything is okay, but it's not. We really need our voices to be heard. That's why we're using social media. changing something. Women here are not okay. We're suffering and we really want to expose this. We want the world to see that there is still slavery in 2016 and it has to end forever. Now there's big news recently because Saudi Arabia was allowing women to drive. But what you didn't hear in the news was that they still have to get a male guardian's permission before they can get a driver's license and before they leave the house. So even though they, can, they have a driver's license, they can't do any of that without a male's permission. Can't purchase a vehicle, can't even leave the house. So the guardianship laws are still restricting women even though this supposed yay women can drive thing has been released in order to appease the people that are speaking out against this and to appease basically Westerners and say, oh, look at us, we're so moderate and um, we're allowing our women to drive. So that's in Saudi Arabia and this is in Iran, the other country that follows Sharia law fully. Now, Sharia law is a combination of the Quran and the Sunnah. So it is made through taking the, what is written in the scriptures of Islam and creating laws from it. So these laws are based on the religion. Um, so basically this is my stealthy freedom that I mentioned before, that the women were taking the hijabs, tying it on a stick, and then waving it in the air and those women are being imprisoned for it. I hope that you will just, next time you're on Twitter or on Google, hashtag my stealthy freedom, and just take a look at what these women are doing, these brave women. They're burning their hijabs in the streets, uh, they're dancing in the streets, which is also illegal, it's illegal to dance. Um, music is haram. All of these things are illegal, but these women are pushing boundaries. They're incredibly brave, and they really need the support of feminists from the rest of the world to prop them up and to encourage them. But instead, we have the feminists over here with this really confusing left-right alliance. So here in America, when we talk about right-wing, the most right-wing American here would still be considered left-wing in the Muslim world. So we're talking like way further right right now. So um, like I mentioned before, we know that when you see Mormon underwear, okay, so those are orthodox, like these are really conservative people. When you see these Amish people here, you understand, okay, these are super conservative people. They're not your mainstream Christians. It's the same thing with a hijab. But Nike chose to put a swoosh on the hijab, but they wouldn't choose to put a swoosh on Mormon underwear or on these Amish aprons. That's the confusion I'm talking about. That's the double thing I'm talking about. So there is this there's refusal to understand that it's just a religion, 
just like these other religions, and hijab is just a symbol of a far-right interpretation of that religion. There's this phobia that um, Ali Rizvi calls the Islamophobia phobia. And nobody wants to speak out against the issues in Islam because they get told that it's Islamophobic. They get shut down and told that they're being racist. And so they bite their tongue. But what ends up happening when you bite your tongue is you're allowing the people that are oppressed under these regimes, you're turning your back on them. So that's what happened, if I could give you a little story about what happened to me as well. When I was that first year when you saw me wearing the hijab there in grade eight, and I spoke to my drama teacher about what was happening to me at home, and social services got involved, the police got involved, it went all the way to court, and everybody saw the bruises, everybody knew the stories, everybody understood what was happening to me, but in the end, the judge said, every person is free to discipline their child however they want, according to their own cultural norms. So that cultural relativism told me when I was a little kid that had you been a blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl and sitting in my courtroom showing me these bruises, then I would protect you. But because your family come from Egypt, hanging you upside down in the garage and beating the bottom of your feet is totally valid in their culture. So I'm going to send you back home. It wasn't even back home because I never left home. I was hoping to. But I never got out. That's what happens when you don't want to talk about it and you just ignore it, is you're leaving victims in those situations. So we end up getting betrayed by our allies. People that are supposed to believe in the same things that we believe in. Freedom. In, the, in Canada, we recently had a motion pass called M103 and it was dubbed the Islamophobia motion. And basically what that motion said was that you cannot speak up, speak up against Islam. And so a lot of people were standing around Parliament protesting this motion. And this woman here from Pakistan is one of the people that was protesting. She's not covering her face because she's an observant Muslim. She's covering her face because she's afraid of the other protesters that are there pro M103. Silence is deadly. What does that mean? Uh, it means that we have the right to speak out against any ideology that we want to and criticize it for the crimes that it commits, well, people commit in its name. In Islam, uh, a lot of Christians in different countries and other Muslims are persecuted because they're different. And we should be, and it's done in the name of religion. And if we don't speak out against them, then they, they're killed. Are, are you from the Islamic world yourself yes, now? Yes, I am. In which country would that be? I'm from Pakistan. Okay, and so you've seen, I, I guess, the dark side of Sharia in your home nation. Then. Absolutely. My family members have seen people accused of blasphemy law. Um, tied to the back of cars and dragged through the streets and killed that way. There's a woman, Asiya Bibi, she's been in jail for seven years because someone falsely accused her of blasphemy. And there's a Christian girl who, uh, who's a refugee. She was accused of blasphemy and she escaped with her life and it's here in Canada. And can you imagine how she feels when um, something similar to the blasphemy law that she escaped from is like being implemented here in Canada? And, and What's incredible is that, I mean, you've lived through this, you, you've seen it with your own eyes, and yet you have these predominantly white Canadians <clears throat> that are having a counter-protest about what you're doing, and they're calling people like you and others here racist, bigots, Islamophobes. What's going on? Well, the problem is they're not very intelligent. <laughs> they, they're not well-educated, they're not informed about the atrocities that happen in different parts of the world. We come to Canada for a better life. We want to leave that world behind, and we want to celebrate the beauty and the values of this country. And we don't want that 
horrible, horrible draconian laws that follow us here. Sorry. What, what can they possibly say to you when you point out, listen, I'm originally from Pakistan. I've seen the dark side of Sharia. Um, why, why are you campaigning against people that are standing up for freedom of speech? Well, when they call me fascist and they call me a white supremacist, I tell them... They call you a white supremacist? Me a white supremacist. Last time I was here, they're calling me a Nazi scum and a white supremacist. And I'm like, I'm not. How can I be racist against my own people? And they say, it doesn't matter. You still are. And I want to say to them that I'm standing up for my women, my sisters that have died, my sisters that are in jail, the Safiya girls. They were Afghani Muslims and they were killed because their parents thought they were too westernized. <coughs> Canada is a beautiful country. I was born in Canada. I went back to Pakistan many times. My parents are from there. My family still lives there. And my family, I, it's just a horrible thing. Um, they don't understand. They'll never understand until they live there. They wouldn't even last one day under Sharia law. Like what you just saw, then click subscribe below and never miss another Rebel video. We also had a young girl who was 16 years old that was killed by her family because she didn't want to wear a hijab. And these kinds of things, people tend to think that they happen in other countries. Whether it happens in other countries or whether it happens in our country, it's, it's, it's something that we need to speak up against. I know that when people find out that it happens in their own backyard, they get more upset about it and they feel like, but that kind of thing shouldn't happen in America. That kind of thing shouldn't happen in Canada. Well, that kind of thing shouldn't happen anywhere. We should be speaking out against it no matter where it's happening. And when we don't, what we end up doing is we're, like I said, we're turning our backs on the victims of these oppressive regimes. We're turning our backs on the victims of these theocracies. So I implore you to please turn around Talk about it. Speak up. When you see something that's happening, if you read about something that's happening, if you want to talk about it, talk about it. Don't allow people to silence you by throwing mean words at you. Don't accept it. Don't let those words stick. They mean nothing. Speak up for what you believe in. Keep questioning. Keep thinking. Keep talking. And that's my message to you today. Thank you, Yasmin. Um, one moment, please. Hi, uh, I'm from Egypt. My name is Amr Ali. Um, I really respect your experience, your personal experience, but I cannot tolerate with uh, uh, being selective and manipulating things because you mentioned many things. Do you have a question? I'm good. Look, I have the right to speak, so please give me like two minutes to speak. That's actually Q&A, so I'm asking you what your question yeah, is. Yeah, okay, okay, I will ask you. For example, in the, in the first video you mentioned, you said that Islam mapped the entire day of Muslim and gives little opportunity to think. Why you didn't think about like Ahmed Zouaib, who, who, who won the Nobel Prize in physics, who was a Muslim, and, and, and was very proud of his Islam and his relationship to, okay. to God. So, Why you didn't mention Naguib Mahfouz, who was also a Muslim and got an Nobel Prize in literature. And, and like many things you have mentioned, for example, you portray the Egyptian woman wearing May I respond to your question? May I finish? Okay. No, you're finished. No, I'm not finished. If you look at Pew Research, my experience, your experience, that's just our own personal experience. What we need to do is we need to look at statistics. We need to look at Pew Research. And when you look at Pew Research, you'll see that in places like you're from Egypt, so we'll talk about Egypt, for example, 86% of Egyptians think that people that leave Islam should be killed. There is a big, big gap between what you're saying and between what is actually exist in Sharia law, because in Sharia law, those who left Islam are not killed. Really? Yeah, really. You go and review it, and I'm sorry because I have a degree from Al-Azhar University, so I really know what I'm talking about. In Sharia law, Islam or Muslims are only fighting those who fight Islam. Okay. For example, 
Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he did not kill if I anyone. Will you kill me? I'm an atheist. Will you kill me? I'm by myself. No way. I will not kill you. I have, I have my own friends who are atheists and I will not kill them. I'm just trying to explain that being selective does not help actually. You're being selective and I'm being selective, okay? So if you want to know the truth, you have to look at the research. Why like wouldn't said, you so describe you the truth? Research supports what can, you, can you please tell us yeah. this, this statistically how many women in Egypt wear niqab? You know what I can tell you statistically? 99.3% of women in Egypt have been sexually assaulted. Yes, that's true. Even what what that has to, to do with Islam? Because that is the reason why women wear hijab and niqab is to protect right. them from sexual assault. Does anyone have another question? Does it work? Yeah, I got a question. Here, I'll... Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Your question's over, Bald dude. Uh, my question is: Why do why does certain elements of the left in the United States uh, align themselves with the most orthodox and uh, oppressive versions of Islam if they consider themselves liberals? That's an excellent question, and I would love to have the response to that question. That's exactly what I was mentioning here. This left-right alliance is incredibly confusing. It makes no sense. These same women that have a Sharia law supporter leading them in this march, these same women refuse to allow conservative American pro-choice, sorry, not pro, pro-life women join their march. So. Americans were too conservative for them, they don't want them included in there, but Sharia, which is only about a billion times more conservative than a conservative American, is leading their march. So I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Oh, Maddie? Okay, so a little bit on the theology of Islam. What are typical verses that you like to cite to help let people realize that something might be wrong with their ideology. For example, I am an atheist, so I use, for example, Quran verse 434, which cites that women are a man's property, and if she's disobedient, you can beat your wife after first scolding her. Um, and I also try to draw parallels between, for example, Allah and Zeus and Ra in ancient Egypt. So what examples can you give to Muslims for them to realize that Allah is no different than Zeus or Ra from their theology? Well, I'm not interested in getting Muslims to leave their religion. Or I'm not interested in getting anybody to leave their religion. Anybody is free to believe whatever they want to believe. What I'm interested in is not allowing those beliefs to creep into other people's lives. So I'm against these theocracies that I mentioned here that follow Sharia law. And I'm against celebrating religious things like putting a hijab on Barbie. That's the kind of thing I'm against. I'm against religion in schools, I'm against religion in government. So what I try to, most Muslims don't even speak Arabic. They can't even understand the Quran when they read it. So they have to go through interpreters. A lot of them go through imams that just tell them whatever it is that they want to tell them. You know, that Muhammad was a really nice guy and he didn't rape a young girl and he didn't have sex slaves. So, what I ask for Muslims to do is just read your holy book. It is one book. It's not going to take that much time out of your life. Read it, translate it into whatever language you speak. Just go on Quran.com. Everybody has access to it. Go on Quran.com. Choose the language that you're most comfortable with and read that book. Because it's like the terms and conditions on a website. Muslims have clicked it, and they've gone on with their lives. And actually, they haven't even clicked it. They were born into it. And they just go on with their lives, not understanding this religion that they're identifying with. So if you read that book with all of the horrible things that are in it, and you still want to follow it, then that's your business. But I am absolutely sure that if more Muslims read their book, understood their religion, read the history of the prophet, they wouldn't be Muslim anymore. Is that just about Islam or other religions too? Anybody have a question?
Thank you very much for doing this and coming all the way from Canada. Uh, you mentioned that after seeing Bill Maher's show, that was kind of the tipping point for you. What is the, I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of people who watched that show and didn't change at all. What do you think is the challenge that most of the religious people face to come out of the religion? What is the challenge, sorry? That religious people may face to come out of the religion. Oh, it's very, I don't expect, when people talk about 1.6 billion Muslims, I don't, I don't buy that number, for, not for one second. I know people that are Catholic that won't even, or that grew up in Catholic homes that won't even tell their parents that they're atheists now, right? And there is no verse in the Bible that says to kill somebody who leaves their religion. So, I mean, in Islamic countries, in the Middle East and North Africa, Yes, there are laws, or 13 countries, that in the laws says that if you leave Islam, you are to be killed, you're sentenced to death legally. But even in countries where it's not, there are still social, you know, there's honor killings that are going to happen. So let me tell you about Mashal Khan, for example, in Pakistan. He was in his university, and he was he's a humanist, and he was questioning his religion, and he was not killed by police officers or by the government. He was killed by his classmates. They pulled him into the quad and they beat him to death. When his mother went to, to identify his body, she said that even the bones in every one of his fingers were broken. Okay, So that's the kind of thing Muslims are up against. So they're not going to speak up, no. And in Jordan, for example, where again, it's not against the law to leave Islam, but if you do, you are no longer considered a citizen of the country. So any property that you owned, you no longer own. Even your wife or your husband, you're no longer legally married. You're no longer legally attached to your children. And that's the kind of thing people are up against in Islamic countries. Even here in the West, where we're free to speak out, it's very, very dangerous. For me, the the only, if my, I wouldn't have not, it's been 15 years since I've had contact with anybody in my family because I left us then. So that's the kind of sacrifices people have to make. And so a lot of people just aren't willing to make that big of a sacrifice. So my name is Heather and I'm from Pakistan. And, uh, Last year, one of my family, uh, very close family member, uh, was accused of uh, past family charges because he was primarily uh, critical of the state, Pakistani state, the human rights violations that were occurring there. And as a result, he was being uh, he was one of the bloggers who went missing, and eventually the state uh, appeared as somehow uh, diffused the whole thing uh, using the past famous uh, charges. What I would like to say is that. I have been studying uh, Islamic uh, history, uh, and I find that there is a lot of intellectual discourse that not only happened uh, in the past, but also that might be present at, uh, at, the, at the right at this moment. Yeah, I agree. So, uh, whatever you are saying, uh, I really respect whatever uh, you have been going through. And uh, since I have gone through, uh, through that uh, uh, feeling as well, uh, how uh, religious sentiments can really go out of control, so I really uh, respect the way like, you have carried on. So my point is, do you think that anything, like if I talk about the solution, do you think like calling out the whole Muslim world as something, a danger to the, to the uh, world, uh, can be part of solution, or can we identify that okay, there there has to be some intrinsic, there has to be some organic movements that need to change the situation within Muslim world, and also you talk about two theocracies, the one in Iran and the one in Saudi Arabia. So while I am one of those who is fighting our for our liberal values, what I see is the role of West. Okay. How they try to manipulate and how they try to enforce 
uh, the, uh, uh, the, the powers the, who are uh, illiberal, who are conservative, they enforce them on us, right? And uh, what do you think about them? Like uh, the, the coup in Iran uh, back in the 50s because uh, there were some national tendencies against the oil, um, um, uh, oil privatization thing. Uh, that people say that that really played a very important role in bringing the, the theocracy that we have today in Iran. And similarly, uh, Ali Saud uh, and Ali Wahab, uh, 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 how they have been supported by the British yes, Empire. So, so I would just like to mention that uh, when you talk about Islam, Islam, yeah, definitely there has to be a fight within. Yes. But whatever is happening outside, uh, I would like also. I would also like to hear about that, which can happen here, which you can raise question. Okay, uh, okay it's something that we can do. Okay, right thank here. you. Let me, let me just start responding before I forget all of the things that you said. Uh, so if we go back to this left-right alliance, I think that's what you're referring to. What's got to happen is that people that believe in freedom and liberty here need to be supporting people that believe in freedom and liberty all over the world. So Raif Bedoui is a Saudi Arabian blogger who is in prison right now. Um, uh, I completely forgot his name. A Bangladeshi blogger. Oh, I forgot his name. I feel really bad. Um, but bloggers all over the Muslim world who are just writing their opinions, writing their feelings, are getting killed, getting imprisoned. Like you mentioned, it's happening in Pakistan. Even Facebook is cracking down on friends of mine that live in Pakistan that they're telling them that your page can no longer be seen in Pakistan in order to protect you from the authorities. So those kinds of things are happening, and that's the clear and present danger that we need to be addressing first. We need to be talking, what you said, is Islam a danger to the rest of the world? Islam is a danger to Muslims, first and foremost, right? There are people that are oppressed under these regimes. We need to take care of that first. Because in the triage of issues, that's the most important issue right now. I, I also agree with you that there are a lot of liberal voices in the Muslim world. Absolutely there are. And they are not only being silenced over there, they're being silenced over here as well. That's the really unfortunate part, is that this alliance shouldn't be happening in this direction. It should be, liberal people here should be supporting liberal people there. Instead, we have liberal people here supporting the Muslim Brotherhood, right? So that's, that's a real problem. Totally agree with you. It needs to happen in those countries, but the reason why it's not happening in those countries successfully right now is because those countries are theocracies, and people will be killed for it. People will be arrested for it. So we need to support them, for sure. Uh, Our so governments need just to Just to add, like... Um... Can I speak if you will allow me? Uh, yeah. Can we? We'll come back to you. There's a lot of questions. Sure. Sure. Good evening, and thank you for coming out today. Um, my main question would be on holy left-right alliance. Um, what factor do you find um, third wave feminism playing inside the role of like this acceptance of this Islamic Brotherhood inside the United States? Well, there's the most confusing ones for me. Actually, because I consider myself a feminist, certainly not a third wave feminist, just like I consider myself a liberal, but certainly not liberal what it means these days. So, uh, exactly, classical liberal. So, that, and classical feminist too, I suppose, right? I believe in the equality of human beings. So, um, in the same way that I'm confused over people that believe in liberal values or supporting these kinds of incredibly draconian values, I'm also confused by how women can support a religion that is unapologetically misogynistic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, that's live. <laughs> uh, oh, um, so my question is that I, I, I first off thank you for like educating so much for me. I, I didn't know that like 
the hijab is like representative of the orthodox um, sector and same with like the idea of the the driving women driving in Saudi. I didn't know that it's all the things underlying. Um, my question is like, what is what do you think is the next step that like we can keep pushing, and how do you think people like people living in this room can get behind that? Well, I think that the way the first is so. The first question is, what do I think the next step is? I think the next step is there needs to be a separation of mosque and state. Right? These countries need to become secular so that the people in these countries can make their own decisions. So in, uh, in Somalia, just last year, 50 people were killed for becoming Christian, for leaving Islam and becoming Christians. So they found the church that they were all going to and they killed them all. That shouldn't happen. That can't happen. That can't be happening. People should be allowed to choose to believe whatever faith they want or to not believe in any faiths if they don't want. So I think that secularism is the answer to this, and allowing people the freedom to choose their freedom of thought. As far as what people in this room can do, I think what people in this room can do is just, when people try to shut you down from questioning and criticizing, then I think that you should not let it work. Don't let those tactics work. Because if you shut yourself down, if you bite your tongue here, then you're no different then the Abjit Roy, and that's his name, I completely forgot his name before, Abjit Roy in Bangladesh, or Mashal Khan in, in Pakistan, or Raj Badawi in, in Saudi Arabia. These are people that have been shut down through being killed or being imprisoned and are not allowed to speak their mind. So even though over there it's top down shutting people up, over here it's bottom up. We shut each other up. And that's what needs to stop. Yeah. Hey guys, if you want to uh, speak, Madeline's going to stand right there. If you have questions, just make a line. It'll just be yeah. much easier. Thank you. Yeah. Hello, okay. so last uh, Monday night, Tuesday morning, uh, the woman from the Rebel video was actually banned from uh, England. Um, this was because she had what was considered a lot of Islamophobic material on her. Um, and my question is, and it seems to, seem to be the concern in uh, England at the moment too, um, how can we fight state, the development of like a uh, state sanction of religion? Um, this goes for any religion, obviously, to prevent you know, issues like effectively ancient blasphemy laws coming back to like, Western democracies. Yeah, so the Western democracies are gonna follow what their people want. So we're the ones that get to, to vote. So if our voices are loud enough, they're going to start to listen. If people get angry enough over things like this, then they're going to pay attention. But if people turn their backs and they don't care, or if people call each other racist and Islamophobic for speaking up, then the government's going to keep on doing what they're doing. Thank you. You guys could also say your names, too, when you speak. Hi, I'm Caitlin. Um, I just wanted to ask you what would be the best way to open up a conversation if I were to come face to face with someone in this march, or more likely someone that would be on this campus, and most of the time it's been suggested that I have some fear of the hijab or the symbolism, these things you're talking about, they automatically become angry, they don't want to have a conversation with me, it becomes more of a yelling fest where they try to yell me down. What is the best way to start a conversation about this, and where should the direction, what's the direction the conversation should be? Well, I find it most interesting that it's totally fine for you to criticize aspects of Christianity. So if you're going to start talking about fundamentalist Christians, for example, and you can talk about um, purity culture there, or modesty culture, purity reigns, this obsession with virginity, yada yada, talk about it in that context, and then just keep talking. <laughs> Because they're going to be all on board when you're talking about Christianity. They're super happy to criticize that. But then when you're criticizing the exact same modesty culture within a different religion, that's when things change. So that's, that's how I would say start, get them all comfortable first with agreeing that these things are something that you're both against, and then just keep going. Thank you. So my question is, like, so you showed that that video of uh, Abdul Nasser uh, from Egypt, like, uh, and to your point, which kind of that, like, 
uh, almost like uh, 50 years ago, uh, it, like some of these countries were more uh, moderate than they are now. Like, what do you think has caused that backlash? Do you think it's it's just like that that Muslims in these countries know more about the West, and they there's like there's like a backlash to it, like via the internet and all, or do you think it has to do with um, like uh, U.S. like involvement in in uh, uh, like in the Middle East, or what, what do you think is the, the cause? So the cause of that was most definitely the Muslim Brotherhood. So the Muslim Brotherhood, that was their mission. So there are, if you are a devout Muslim, then you feel that it's your duty, because Islam teaches, that you need to spread the word of Allah. You need to spread Islam. So there's two kinds of ways that people spread Islam. Through jihad, which we're all familiar with, right? Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Boko Haram, et cetera, et cetera. So they're spreading Islam through the same way that uh, the earlier Muslims did, through the sword. Now, after the Ottoman Empire fell, Muslims got together in Egypt and they're like, what are we going to do now? How are we going to get our empire back again? We can't get it back in the same way we got it the first time, through the sword, because the world has changed now. So now we have to do it through diplomatic means. We have to do it through um, using government or whatever. So that's when they came up with Islamists. So Islamists are like the Muslim Brotherhood, the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Cooperative, which are the largest intergovernment organization after the UN, are just a huge voting bloc of about 60 countries, and that is their mission. So Islamists are basically jihadis in a nice suit and tie. So if you're familiar with Majin Nawaz, he is a Muslim man who used to be a member of Hizb al-Tahrir, which are, like the Muslim Brotherhood, another Islamist organization. And he left them, and now he is a reformer Muslim, he's a modern Muslim, and he speaks out against these guys. So um, we are very aware of the jihadis that are trying to spread Islam through trucks and through nail bombs and through stabbing people, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, but we're not so aware of the quieter Islamists like Linda Sarsour, who is leading the Muslim march. Yeah, so those are, are people that we need to be aware of as well. I honestly can't remember your question, I just went off. <laughs> like the, um, like just, just why it, it, things went backwards. And stuff. Oh yeah, so it was the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt that it was their mission to spread Islam and they talk about it very transparently online. They'll say, we're going to spread Islam through different means. One of them is through the laws, using secular laws against themselves. Another means is immigration. And another means is through the wombs of the Muslim mothers. So that's why it's spread, because of Islam. Uh, also, I, sorry, I know I've been asking for a while, but like, so what do you think caused the rise of the, the brotherhood? Because they got together in the in the 1920s, and they're like, how are we going to get our empire back again? How are we going to spread this land back the way it was under the Ottoman Empire? To try and maintain what the Ottoman Empire was. Correct. They want to get their glory days back. Yeah, my mom is still angry about losing Spain. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, just so everybody knows, we're going to cut off the questions after Max. Hi, my name is Moshe. I just had a quick question. So, addressing this unholy left-right alliance that you're talking about, I feel like a lot of times people feel uncomfortable criticizing a religion, especially when it's not their own, um, especially because there are individuals that they feel like maybe it means a lot to them, they have some sort of connection to. And I'm wondering if you feel like the ultimate root of the problems that you've been talking about are the religion, Islam, or is it the cultures that use the religion and exploit it for their own purposes? For example, in Saudi Arabia and Iran. Yeah. So I don't think that there ex well, I think that there is a problem with the religion itself. Even not forget Saudi Arabia, forget Iran. I was born and raised in Canada. There is a problem with the religion. There's a problem with a verse in the Quran saying that if you fear disobedience from your wife, beat her. Right? That's just one out of the gajillions of verses that there's problems with. So Yes, absolutely, once theocracies have power, 
they don't want to give up that power. And the best way, you know, religion is used as a tool to control the people. Sure, to scare them. If you don't listen, you're going to go to hell. It's, it's, it's already there. People are already scared of hell. So it's a perfect little instrument to use to keep the, the masses controlled. Yes. But even if we're not under Islamic theocracy, the religion of Islam is still very dangerous. Real quick on that. So do you think there's any situation where like an individual may interpret that differently and may... 100%. And may... Yes. That happens all the time. You know, there's, there's one Islam, but there's 1.6 billion Muslims. So among those billions of Muslims, or millions of Muslims, everybody's interpreting it a different way and everybody's following it a different way. Of course not everybody is following it to the letter to the T the way my family did, right? And the way a lot of people do in the world today, the majority of Muslims are conservative if we look at the research. However, I am fully 100% supportive of Muslim reformers who are a new group of people that have just come out very recently, Asr Namani here in the States, um, Majnuwaz, like I mentioned, in the UK, Ibrahim Tahidi in Australia, they're all over the place. And basically what these people are saying is we can somehow marry humanist, liberal <coughs> values, and the religion of Islam together. We can, we can do this. So they believe that they can convince Muslim people to cherry pick out of the Quran and out of the Hadith the parts that do not coincide with this century. And all the power to them. Completely Thank you. Them. Hi, I'm David. Thanks for coming. I was going to agree with you that this alliance makes no sense. And we see a lot of it, I guess, with the anti-Israel groups on campus. But um, my question was, um, I went to a high school with a girl, and she wore a hijab, but for her, it was more of an identity thing, because she was a proud Muslim, but she was very secular. So I'm just curious like, what you thought about that in a way. Great for her. My problem is when girls have to wear it when they don't want to wear it. Okay. If you wear it because you want to wear it, that's, that's great. I have, I have no issue. Thank you. Appreciate it. <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you for coming. Um, my question has to do with statistics. Um, hope I remember everything I plan to say. So first of all, uh, about the the uh, Bill Maher show, um, you said it's usually considered great associated with racism when people criticize Islam. And um, statistically, a lot of depictions of Islam are racialized. And if you look at the numbers, a hate crime, someone who may be Arab but may not identify as Muslim, may be targeted just because of that. So that's one thing. Um, also depictions in Hollywood, you know, Arabs are usually depicted as Muslims. We're referred to a lot as the Muslim world, regardless of, no one really bothers to check what each individual's um, identity is. So that's one aspect. So I think that because of the power imbalance, because of evidence, uh, statistics, that's why criticisms of Islam can be considered they are racialized, they're not considered. Well, it's, it's ignorance, right? So it's, that's the problem. Is there, like that picture I showed before with all of the women in the club, so people assuming that they are all one race, so it's just not knowing, not understanding that it's not one race. Um, and when you talked about hate crimes, the number one group, religious group globally, that suffers from hate crimes are Jewish people. So they are the ones that are having to, and when you're talking about Jewish people in Hollywood, I mean, that's been happening back in Shakespeare's day, even, you know, you have the miserly Jew. So they've been dealing with these stereotypes for a long time as well. So um, I'm not really sure if it has stopped people from, you know, like it, it doesn't stop people. If you want to criticize something, you still criticize. Jewish people aren't hitting us with trucks of peace because we're criticizing their religion, right? Or because we're criticizing anything about their culture. So I don't think that that should impede us from speaking up against bad ideas. It shouldn't, but um, the way that it's, it's done shouldn't be racialized. But anyway, uh, my other point was about, so when we talk again about statistics, uh, you spoke about Egypt. So while 99 would be a great number in Egypt, it wouldn't be a great number in the Muslim world. And we're talking about the Muslim world, we're not talking about Egypt. Uh, in the same way, um, due to my own personal research, more than 70% of women um, in my country um, identify with the hijab. This was an anonymous research. 
in the same way that number does not represent the Muslim world, that, that, that number represents my country only, which is Bahrain. It wouldn't represent like the Muslim world. I cannot come up and say, well, you know, because 70% of women in Bahrain identify with the, with the hijab, that would erase the, the, not even the rest of women in the rest of the Muslim world who don't identify with it and who have to wear it, but also the 30% who doesn't identify with it in Bahrain. So these numbers, while they can be strong, while that can be a strong number in Egypt, it wouldn't hold when we talk about the Muslim world. Yeah, so. yeah. So you are correct, like the gentleman that spoke before you, there are some women that choose to wear the hijab, and I'm not here to say anything about those women. That's, that's great. I'm talking about women that are forced to wear it through whether it's government pressure or whether it's familial or social or whatever kind of pressure. Those are the women I'm here to speak up for. And when people come forward and they say, oh, well, you know, 70% of, of Muslim women choose to wear it. I don't, that's an anonymous statistic, but we'll have to look into that. But even if that were true, would you stand up there and say, well, only one in five women are raped. So why are we talking about rape? No, I wouldn't. No, I you wouldn't. Absolutely so it's wouldn't. the exact same thing. We should be talking about the victims. We should be talking about people that are being oppressed by these things. I agree with you. But at the same time, we shouldn't, at the same time, enable the term that's apparently not popular here, which is Islamophobia. We shouldn't uh, we shouldn't be doing two, like in order to do one positive thing, we shouldn't do one negative so thing. So when Leah Remini did her a &E special about Scientology, yeah. do you think that she was enabling Scientologyism? I'm not familiar with that. Okay, so. so she speaks out against Scientology. Or if I were standing here speaking out against uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, would you say that I'm enabling some sort of bigotry against Jehovah's Witnesses or against Scientologists? It depends on how you would do it. So I would criticize a lot, of, a lot of the things that you talked about today. I would just, so my issue isn't with the substance, it's so with the... So when you criticize an idea, you cannot say that I'm enabling bigotry against people that follow that idea. That's an unfair statement. It's, it's not that you... You don't do it on purpose, it's not intentional, but you are aware of the consequences, yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure you are. You know, speaking out against anything, those would be consequences. So should we just not never talk about it? But anyway, thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. Hey, Yasmin, thanks for coming here. Um, I actually have some news about a journalist that was banned from entering the UK because uh, she released a pamphlet that criticized Islam. She was, she was banned from entering the UK. And I'm just, I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, the UK is a secular state. I don't know why they'd, why they'd uh, ban journalists from entering the country. Yeah, she's under terrorism. Say that again. She was held under the Schedule 7 Terrorism Act. Yeah, she was held under, what well, he said, the terrorism. <laughs> <laughs> she was held under that. I didn't get a chance to read the full article, but should countries be banning speakers for criticism? An ideology? Or? Absolutely not. I completely disagree with that. And what's really sad is that um, the Muslim Brotherhood that I mentioned before, they're considered a terrorist organization all across the Muslim world. Their head office is in London, UK. So it's pretty sad that like the free world, you know, is acting this way, acting in the same way. There, there you go, with the left-right alliance. They're acting the same way that the government's of Pakistan and Iran and Saudi Arabia and Bangladesh and all the rest are acting. Cool. Um, so I have my question is long time no see too. Um, my question is is that so how I noticed like I follow I'm on Twitter twenty four seven and I see a lot of these young women older women take off their hijabs in Iran and yet there's not a lot of support from mainstream media or media in general. What can we do to help them? Just continue to share their videos, continue to share that hashtag, continue to speak out when you see a hijab on Barbie, or in Macy's, or L'Oreal, or Revlon, or Dolce & Gabbana. Like, speak out. Say, like, why aren't you doing this with other religions? Why don't we have a Hasidic Jew Barbie where you can take off her wig and put it back on her bald head? Why not? Why do we have a hijabi Barbie? You know, these are the kind, we need to speak up, that's the problem. Like I said before, our media is only going to listen to us, because we're the ones that are going to pay for these products, right? So if we're not happy with what they're doing, they need to hear about that. And that's 
the only way that we can make change. And there's a, a quote that was on my little tea bag, little piece of paper that said, um, you know, the largest forest of thousands of trees began with one seed. 